Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I wanted to show you guys a quick example of creating blueprint code for an object inside of Unreal Engine 4. And if you don't already know, Blueprint is basically visual node-based coding. Generally, I find that it makes it a lot easier to look at complicated code situations and easier to understand what's going on compared to traditional text-based coding, like if you did C++ with Unreal Engine 4. So before we get started writing anything, let me open up the default third-person character here. So this is in the third-person example content that you can get whenever you create a new project. So in the world outliner, I'm going to click over here for the third person character. That's this guy over here and click on edit blueprint. So whenever an actor has a blueprint attached to it, you'll see the edit option over here. And that allows you to pull up this window here where you'd be able to see the code that's written for that blueprint object over on the event graph. There's also a viewport where you can see all of the components that are attached to the blueprint and how they should be positioned with respect to each other. So you can see that this capsule component, which would be used for detecting collisions, is positioned right over the mesh itself. So a capsule component would be a lot easier to calculate collisions for than a moving mesh like this. Um, so that's why you use simplified objects for that kind of thing. And the mesh, of course, is what you would actually physically see as the game character in the game. But anyway, if we go over to the event graph, you can see some of the code that was written for this character. So for instance, a really simple example here would be the jump action. So inside of the project settings, you can set up input keys for what a certain action should be. Basically, what key do you press to jump? And then in this case, this is an event node. So whenever the event is triggered by that key being pressed, you should run the jump function on the characters. So you'll know that a node is a function node because it will have this F symbol next to the name of it. And a function is supposed to take an input or several inputs and give you one or more outputs when everything has been calculated inside of it. One of the advantages to using functions is that you can encapsulate a lot of what goes on in your code into one single node. So the idea is that once the jump function has been written, you don't need to know how it makes the character jump. You just need to know that it will make the character jump if you put in the right inputs. In this case, you just need to tell it when to jump with this execution connection between uh, the pressed event of the event node and the execution for the jump function. And so Blueprint is really great because you can make a lot of things happen without actually having to manually type code. You wouldn't have to worry about things like adding the right type of bracket in or semicolons at the end of your line. All you really need to do is to put the right nodes onto the screen and make sure that they're connected in the right order. And that might be oversimplifying it a lot. Uh, if you needed to make something very complicated, it's still going to be complicated if you write it in Blueprint or in C++ code. But I do find it really fun to work with Blueprint. So now that that's all said, let's go ahead and actually create an example for ourselves. So if we want to create a new Blueprint, we can right click in our content browser and go to Create Basic Asset Blueprint Class. And from there, we can choose a parent class. So this is basically going to be the root object which we are attaching our code to. In many cases, this would just be an actor. So an actor can be any normal object that gets placed into the world. But if you were trying to make a moving character such as an enemy, you would probably choose character instead. So for right now, to keep things straightforward, let's go ahead and choose a actor as the base class. So I'm going to call this BP for blueprint. You can use whatever naming convention you want. And I'll call this a text counter. So what we'll make in this video is a floating 3D text indicator of how many seconds has gone by since the game has started. So when we hit enter, you'll see that the blueprint is now being represented by this little white dot. We can actually drag it onto our scene anywhere that we want. So I'll position it up here. And uh, this little white dot will not show in the middle of the game. By the way, in order to move around in the viewport, I'm right clicking to take control of where the viewport is looking and WASD to move the position of, I guess, this invisible floating camera, you could say. And let's go over and look at where I positioned the actor on top of this little elevated mesh area. So right now it's indicated by a little white dot. I believe if we show that in game, it's actually completely invisible. But as we edit the blueprint, that's not going to be there anymore anyway. 
So don't worry about it. It's just an indicator to show where you're placing your actor. Let's double click on the blueprint. So inside of the blueprint, we can see that this actor has a default scene root attached to it. So a lot of times I'll add a new scene component and replace this default one so that I can rename it. So if you click on the add component drop down and choose scene component, uh, we can position that into the blueprint. So I'll just call this root and I'll replace the default scene component with the root. So that allows us to set the name and it removes the little white circle, whether you want that or not. And so we want this blueprint to be a rotating text counter. So we're going to need a text component in order to code with it on the event graph. So I'm going to add component and search for text here. So text render is going to be 3D floating text. So once again, we can look around the viewport with a uh, right click and WASD. If a component is really far away, but you have it selected like clicking on the text render and you want to see it up close, you can hit in the viewport, which will uh, basically center it on the text again. So now that we have a text render component, if we compile it and look at the game world, we should be able to see the text actually appearing there. So right now it's uh, way too low and probably too small. And it's probably also facing the wrong direction for the player to read because you would need to be on this side of the text right now in order to read it properly. So for this instance of the blueprint, I'm going to hit uh, E in order to rotate it. And I'm going to rotate it 180 degrees by selecting on the gizmo. And that way the text is going to be facing towards the player rather than away from it. And if we hit W to go back to the transform gizmo, we can position it where we want it to be. So I'll have it kind of floating up here in mid air. And in the world outliner, we can go back to the text counter here and hit edit VP text counter to bring it back up in the blueprint editor. So I'm probably going to also want to increase the size of the text itself. So with the text renderer selected, we can go over to the details panel, which allows you to change properties about the selected component, go down to text and world size. And with this, we should be able to increase the size of the text we're trying to say on the world. So I'll give it a solid number there like 60. Uh, compile it, move it out of the way a little bit, and you can see that the size is increased in the actual game world. So because we want to make sure that whenever the game starts that this text is replaced, one thing we could do is change the default text to say something that we would obviously know has not been replaced, like underscore placeholder text or something like that. So if you have a naming convention like placeholder, then you can know that whenever you see this, it's never been replaced and you probably ran into an issue somewhere. Okay, so now we can actually start coding with the blueprint. So over on the event graph, you can see that every time you create a blueprint, it'll give you a few default events that you can use in order to have certain functions trigger. So for instance, you can use event active begin overlap to determine when one object has entered another object's collision area. But in this case, what we're going to want to do is to change the text of the text renderer to be how many seconds has occurred since the game started. So we're going to need a variable for that to store how many seconds have passed. So over on the my blueprint area, bottom left, we can hit plus where next to variables and a variable will store some information that we can access or change later. So when you hit new variable, by default, it will be created as a Boolean. You can hover over the icon to the left to see what type of variable it is. And the variable will be called new var zero. We're going to rename this to something that makes more sense, such as time elapsed since start. Or we could just shorten that to time elapsed, actually. And so over on the details panel, we'll change the variable type from Boolean, which is basically storing whether something is true or false to float, which is a number that can have a decimal point value. So it can be zero, it can be one, but it can also be 0 0.5 or 1.5, which is useful for time because time will often be measured in fractions of a second. So let's make that a floating point number here. And we'll compile the blueprint and you'll see that the default value changes to zero once we do that. So the default value of zero means that whenever this object is created, it's gonna be initialized with this value of zero. So in other words, it starts at zero. So what we're going to want to do to track the time is that whenever event tick runs, which is once a frame, this event will trigger. We want to add the delta seconds, which is the time between frames to time elapsed. So not every frame of the game will actually occur in the same amount of real world time 
Ideally, that would be the case, but if you play a lot of games, you would know that sometimes you get frame rate drops and it actually takes longer for the next frame to render. So delta seconds will give you the amount of time since the last frame. So the way we're going to track the time elapsed is every frame of the game, we want to add the time between frames to the time elapsed. So the way we can get this very easily is using the event tick uh, event node. And whenever this runs, which will occur once per frame, we add the delta seconds, the time between frames, to the time elapsed. And that's basically how we'll calculate that. So every time event tick runs, we're going to want to get and then set the time elapsed to a new value. So I can drag a variable onto the event graph like this, just left click and drag, and then you can choose either get or set. So if you want to get the value in a variable, you choose get, and if you want to set it to a new value, you choose set. So we want to start with get, and then we're going to want to add these two numbers together and then set the resulting total to the new value for time elapsed. So I can also drag time elapsed out here and do a set time elapsed. You'll notice that the set time elapsed has a few more connectors here. So we have one for execution. Uh, An execution means that in the flow of this blueprint code, we need to tell it at what time it should actually execute this setting of the new value. So in this case, it would be whenever event tick runs, we just go straight into the set. So the first thing that happens and the only thing that's going to happen, uh, at least for now, after event tick happens for this particular blueprint is that it's going to go into setting a new value for time elapsed. So now we need to calculate that value and it's pretty easy here. We can click on this little connector out here on the right for time elapsed and then rather than search through all of the possible uh, actions that we can choose, we can just put in a plus sign and that'll immediately filter it down to mathematical operations. Note that context sensitive up at the top right will filter a lot of the options that aren't exactly related to the type of node you were dragging out away. So generally you want context sensitive there so that it only gives you uh, actions that are really related to this float value. So we want to do float plus float here because delta seconds up here is also a float. And in order to break this connection between time elapsed and the plus, I'm going to hold down alt and then left click on the top one because uh, just for the sake of being visually easier to see, I want the one that's closer to go to the top. So that's delta seconds here and then plus time elapsed will go to the bottom. As you might imagine, if you have a lot of these actions going on, then these nodes can get kind of messy with all of their wiring, so it helps to stay a little bit organized. So now on the right side, we get our resulting float, which is the addition of A plus B, the A value delta seconds, B value time elapsed, and we can output that to time elapsed here. So now whenever the tick event is run, the time elapsed value is going to be updated, which is great. Um, now we won't actually be able to see that though, uh, because the text renderer is not showing that value. So in order to set the text of the text renderer, we would want to drag out this text renderer component and then, well, I guess it's automatically a get because it's not a variable. So now we need to take the component reference. You can see what kind of node connector you're dealing with whenever you hover over it. So you can see this is a text renderer component object reference. So it's a reference to the text renderer component object. And uh, we drag this out here and it should have a function for setting text. So I'm going to type in text to filter it. Um, so let's see, set text renderer. I'm not sure that's right. So I think we actually want over here in rendering components text renderer set text. So we need to give it an execution connection and we would choose that from set. So once the value for time elapsed is set here, we then want to set the text. And the value that we're going to be setting it to is actually the number here in this uh, time elapsed node. So whenever this is set, the value stored in time elapsed over here on the left will be updated, but it also gives us an output node. So rather than having to drag to the event graph and doing get time elapsed and plugging this into the value, which would be totally fine, we can actually just save us up by grabbing the set value from the right side of the set node. And you'll see that on this value node, it's actually expecting a text. But if we connect something like a float to it, you'll see that it will automatically try to convert uh, the type we are trying to set the text to, to a text. So in this case, it converts a float to a text and we automatically get this new node down here, which is a uh, to text, which converts a float 
to a text value, which is what we need to store into a uh, text render components text field. So basically, in other words, the float is converted into readable text that can be read on the screen. Now, uh, I think this is all we're going to need here for this short example. So we should hit compile on the top left. If everything's good to go, you'll get this checkbox here and we can go back to the game viewer. Now you can see that before the game actually activates, we still have that placeholder text. The text does not update until the game starts because event tech has not run yet. It only runs during gameplay. But if we hit play here, then we should be able to see this counter occurring over here. And we can see it's kind of crazy. Maybe it's going a little too fast. So we could consider maybe only having it update every, you know, 0.1 seconds or something like that. But it's quite accurately updating the text with the time elapsed since the game has started. Now, instead of having it as a 3D text renderer, you could have it be a widget UI component, which is basically the HUD interface, the items that show on the screen, regardless of where the character or the camera is looking at. The HUD is always showing directly to the camera. Uh, but this is a cool example of one way you can use blueprints in order to achieve coding uh, without having to write any traditional C++ text-based coding. So blueprints can be really cool and it can get quite easy to set up a lot of the basic game functionality in Unreal that you would want to have happen. So thank you for watching this brief introduction to blueprints in Unreal Engine 4. I've been Chris, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in my future video content.